Okay, this video is about the Bankster Thieves, number two. Uh, so, uh, in order to have a proper foundation uh, for this video, you should be have watched uh, Bankster Thieves, number one, uh, Bankrupt Corporate So-Called Governments, uh, the Bar Members video, the De facto Courts video, We're Under Martial Law Rule video, uh, the Quasi Contracts and Roman Civil Law video, and the Peace Officers and Law Enforcement Officers video. Um, after the stock market crash in the 30s and the subsequent depression, because the people were so tired of the banksters' corruption, Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act, which prohibited the banksters from being uh, involved in the stock market. And uh, this is a uh, Greg Glass column uh, at Vice.com. Uh, this was uh, uh, basically, uh, let's get in closer here, um, confidential memo at the heart of the global financial crisis. And um, if you uh, will go down here, and it basically says that the date on this is uh, August 23rd, 2013. And you can see the memo, okay? The, if you look in the, uh, the, the memo, is right there in front of you. And, um, and, but what the interesting thing is, is uh, what the text of the memo says. And so this is a confidential memo at the heart of the global financial crisis. And it's to uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Lawrence Summers, from Assistant Secretary for International Affairs, Timothy Geithner, and the date is November 24th, 1997, and it says, as we enter the end game of the World Tra uh, Trade Organization, Organization Financial Services Negotiations, I believe it would be a good idea for you to touch bases with the CEOs. And uh, it says some other things, but then he lists uh, the names. These are the personal phone numbers uh, of these, uh, these CEOs, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Citibank, and Chase Manhattan. And so these are the personal phone numbers of these guys um, in their office. Uh, so and, and he even actually tried to call the numbers, and they, he got their private secretaries every time. Uh, Palast explains that Geithner is telling his boss at the time, Summers, to call the five most powerful banking CEOs to have them get their lobbyists to lobby to repeal Glass-Steagall because the banks wanted to get into derivatives training. Uh, Palast even calls them banksters, which is very appropriate. Uh, the bankster thieves get their stooge, Barney Frank, and the U.S. House of Representatives Finance Committee, he was the chairman, to lead the charge to get Glass-Steagall repealed because they intended to sell all sorts of these derivatives to governments and investors around the world. A uh, collateralized debt organization obligation is a pool of mortgages that was packaged by the bankster thieves on Wall Street and fraudulently marketed as very good quality, AAA. As a result of the banking deregulation, the banks with these were able to start trading derivatives, which include selling CDOs, uh, which were uh, packages of mortgages, many of them subprime, some of them do not even exist. Under the Clinton administration, they started doing 100% financing in home mortgages, okay, which is the same time frame, and uh, basically, if you're warm, then you qualify. And um, because of the easy qualification, many people who were otherwise unqualified caused a bidding war on the real estate with the subprime mortgages. And, uh, and uh, plus, uh, if you remember, the, uh, uh, the stock market was, uh, uh, the dot-com bubble uh, uh, was, was bursting. And so uh, people were getting out of the stock market and they needed to do something with the money. And so the, that was the next big craze was, uh, was uh, real estate. And so... So between uh, these uh, these uh, subprime uh, un un easy qualified unqualified buyers and uh, and the uh, the people uh, bailing out of the stock market, uh, it caused a huge uh, uh, frenzy in the real estate. Real estate prices became inflated to the point that some markets uh, prices were two to three hundred or more of what prices are today. And uh, investors around the world bought CDOs marketed by the bankster thieves, municipal corporations, uh, mutual funds, other investors. And remember, all of these uh, CDOs were guaranteed by the government. Okay, think about that. <laughs> these All these CDOs, these mortgages, are all guaranteed by the government in one way or another. And, uh, well, I wouldn't say all of them. Some of them have, but they are all got insurance. Okay, they definitely all have insurance. They have mortgage insurance, whether it's... If it's a Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac, if it goes into Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, then it's, it's government, okay? But not all of them went there, but most of them did, certainly. <laughs> Anyways, and uh, anyway, so investors around the world bought CDOs. There's FHA mortgages, there's VA mortgages. Those are all guaranteed by the government. So there's most of them were certainly guaranteed by the government in one way or another. Um, investors around the world bought CDOs marketed by the bankster thieves, municipal corporations, mutual funds, other investors, 
uh, uh, the banks of thieves leverage their own assets up to 30 times. And if you remember when they had the uh, when Lehman Brothers uh, went under, they had uh, the CEO of Lehman Brothers uh, in Congress on on uh, national TV, and the congressman is sitting there saying, "Oh yes, uh, you uh, I see you leveraged leveraged your assets by 30 times." And what that essentially means is that uh, is that. Uh, they uh, had a 3% reserve requirement, so that basically somebody puts 10 bucks in the bank and the bankster thieves can loan out 300 And so uh, anyways, uh, uh, recently there were uh, pirates in Somalia, this is all part of it here, uh, because this is what the bankster thieves are doing with their money. All this money they're making, the billions, the trillions of dollars in interest every year, uh, they're making on this money, this is what they're doing, they're using it to make war on us, that's exactly what they're doing. Recently, there were pirates in Somalia that were assaulting ships off the coast of Somalia. These pirates were captured by the U.S. Navy and brought back to New York for trial. And it came out in the trial that these pirates were owned and operated by Goldman Sachs. And so that's exactly what they're doing is they're taking this money, all this money that's going to them in interest, and they're using it to make war on us. That's exactly what they're doing. And what do you think all this war on terror is all about? It's about the bankster thieves. Um, this is actually... Uh, the Daily Cost, Borowitz reports Somali reports a submit subsidiary of Goldman Sachs. And uh, let's see if we can get in closer. Okay, yes, we can. Uh, the Daily Cost.com. Um, 11 indicted Somali pirates dropped a bombshell in the U.S. court today, revealing that their entire piracy operation is a subsidiary of banking giant Goldman Sachs. Borowitz says that the pirates received bonuses last year amounting to $48 million paid in cash. In doubloons, they merged with Goldman Sachs in 2008 because of the more lax regulation of bankers. Okay, so think about it. You think these banksters are stupid? They got all the money in the world. They literally print it. And so then they buy off congressmen and, and legislators. And, and that's why they, the lax regulation. And that's why they're able to get away with the stuff they do. And, and oh, it just gets better. It's going to get better. We're going to get into this some more. This is actually taken from the Huffington Post. And 11 indicted Somali pirates dropped a bombshell in the U.S. court today, ruling the entire piracy operation as a subsidiary of banking giant Goldman Sachs. And we're doing God's work. We work for Lloyd Blank Flying. And so, yeah, that's God's work, eh? So they're satanic, too. Anyways, and, and the pirate said he earned a bonus of $48 million in doubloons last year, elaborated on the nature of Somali's work for the Goldman, explaining that the pirates forcibly attacked ship that Goldman had already shorted. Okay, so you see what's going on. So they go and make arrangements to attack ships that Goldman had shorted. Okay, so it gets better yet. So the pirate acknowledged that they merged their operation in Goldman to take advantage of more relaxed banking regulations governing bankers as opposed to pirates, plus to get our share of the bailout money. So they went and got bailout money too. Yeah, it gets better yet. It gets better yet. LIBOR is an acronym for London Interbank Offered Rate, which is an interest rate that's used to determine interest rates, underpins $350 trillion. That's T, T, trillion in derivatives, okay? That's probably, you know, I don't know if it's all of them or not, but it's certainly, I mean, the U.S., they say, has like $50 trillion worth of debt, or $99 trillion. So that's obviously, who knows, where well, all of that's worldwide, I suppose. Traders have admitted that LIBOR manipulation has been common since 1991. And this is uh, taken from Wikipedia, and this is, uh, it talks about it. LIBOR underpins approximately $350 trillion in derivatives, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, it, it talks about what the, the in July, on 27th of July 2012, the Financial Times published an article by a former trader which stated that LIBOR, LIBOR manipulation has been common since at least 1991. And this is actually uh, uh, the Telegraph, August uh, 21st, 2014, an article that was published on the 18th of August. First Britain pleads guilty to LIBOR rigging, and uh, there's a, there was a LIBOR scandal exposed in 2008. Gee, that's interesting, hey, how they exposed the LIBOR scandal, and then they had the crash in 2008. And now they're exposing it again, and it looks like they're setting up for one in 2014. And it's admittedly been going on since at least the early 1990s. Because of the LIBOR scandals, interest rates for municipal corporations all over, all over the world have been going up. Uh, former uh, Assistant Secretary of the, uh, for Housing, uh, uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, under the George, uh, George Bush Senior Administration, 
uh, uh, says that many mortgages sold in collateralized debt obligations were for houses that did not exist. And uh, she tried to put a stop to it, and she was removed. She, uh, she actually talks about it in her YouTube videos. Do a search for her on YouTube. She's got some YouTube videos. And she talks about it where uh, she would drive by the house or the location, the street address of this house that was, uh, had this mortgage, and there was no house there. It was an empty lot. These uh, fraudulent, fictitious mortgages were included in CEOs that were sold to investors around the world that were fraudulently rated AAA by the banks to own and operated rating agencies. And so when you deposit money, and this is another thing you have to understand, that when you deposit money in your bank account, the money becomes the property of the bank. Yes, that's true. And you have a contract that says that they have to give it back. Yes, that's true. And therefore, it's an unsecured debt to the bank. Okay? And the same bank sells a CDO, okay, think about it, operative word, collateralized. It is supposed to be collateralized by real estate. A CDO is higher priority than a bank deposit. A bank deposit's an unsecured debt. And in the event of a bankruptcy, the bank deposit gets the lowest priority. And why do you think that, uh, well, we're going to go into that. Over the years, the bar members who have infiltrated governments at every level have conveniently put these governments deep into debt. And see the bar members video. Uh, Lindsey Williams says that his elite friends have said that they have planned to bring out these derivatives for decades to facilitate these bankruptcies. This is all being orchestrated. When the bubble burst in 2008, many corporations went out of business or laid off workers. Some banksters went bankrupt like Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch and AIG, etc. Iceland went bankrupt. Greece has gone into receivership. Spain is on the brink of bankruptcy, and many American states are on the brink of bankruptcy. Because of these derivatives and the LIBOR scandal and the subprime crisis orchestrated by the bankster thieves, debt servicing costs have gone up. Many companies have gone out of business, causing unemployment and also reducing tax revenue for these municipal corporations. And municipal corporations' costs are up and revenues are down, causing a scramble for money and bankruptcies. And so, uh, as this is actually a map that I got off the internet here uh, in uh, August of 2014, and um, and uh, you'll see that that's a list of bankrupt governments in the United States alone. Uh, uh, since 2010, there have been 38 municipal governments that declared bankruptcy. A bankruptcy is effectively a coup d'état for a municipal corporation because the creditors become the new owners, and the creditors are the bankster thieves, as found in the bankrupt corporate so-called governments video and the banker, bankster thieves one and two videos, and uh, and that's actually uh, this this one is the number two. Uh, a, a bankruptcy creates an emergency and justifies martial law rule, as found in the we under Mar we are under martial law rule video. And so you need to be watching these to get a really a good con a good grasp of what's going on. And you might want to watch them two or three times because. You know, it takes time for the stuff to sink in. It's taken me years. Because of these bankster thieves, governments everywhere, bankrupt or not, are raising taxes, fees, etc., and police everywhere are out generating revenue to support the increased debt servicing costs. Well, think about it. If the police are out generating revenue, what do you think they're doing? They're out giving out tickets. That's exactly what they're doing. They're generating revenue, police revenue, and they're doing all sorts of things. All, all the banks in Cyprus went bankrupt when they seized the deposits, right? So again, this is and this is this is just gonna it's just starting to happen all over the world. Lindsay Williams even talks about it. Acts have been passed in Canada, the US and other countries authorizing the seizure of bank accounts. Well when they seize the bank accounts that means the bank is bankrupt. And so what they do is they seize the bank accounts and uh, and they, then they exchange whatever uh, money or uh, that you had in there for shares. You get shares in the bank, and so you become an owner. And so now, now uh, you're stuck with the ownership of this bankrupt bank and an incompetent management, and uh, and and your shares are you know what what are they worth? Who knows? Uh, anyways, they're talking about seizing all 401ks and IRAs in America. Uh, bank deposits have a lower priority than these collateralized debt obligations, these fictitious ones that these bankster thieves were selling. This has all been planned and orchestrated by the bankster thieves. This is only possible because they've completely ignored the gold standard. Banksters everywhere are busy buying up as much gold and silver as they can. Banksters are using the exchange rate stabilization fund to artificially keep the prices of gold and silver down under the pretense of supporting the dollar so they can get it at a cheaper price. And uh, and there was a, in the 90s there was a guy by the name of James Turk that went and uh, was involved with GATA, which is uh, 
uh, um, a gold antitrust um, something uh, uh, association or something like that. Anyways, uh, it was GATA, and um, and uh, he uh, filed a lawsuit against the federal government for manipulating the price of gold. And the federal government's response in the lawsuit was it was under the antitrust act. And uh, the government's response was is that it doesn't apply to us. And so they didn't deny it a bit. The bankster thieves have even refused to deliver the minuscule amount of gold, amount of five tons of gold to Germany uh, 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 for seven years. The, uh, um, uh, it, the, they've requested their gold, and, and the bankster thieves have uh, said, well, we're, we're not going to deliver it for seven years. And so uh, 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 300 tons of gold can be traded in the morning on the, on the Comex exchange, so five tons of gold is nothing. The Federal Reserve Bank was created in the middle of the night on Christmas Eve in 1913. It took less than 20 years for them to, for, for them to bankrupt the country. And this is taken from the U.S. Congressional Record, March 17, 1993. And it says it's an established fact that the United States federal government has been dissolved by the Emergency, Emergency Banking Act, March 9, 1933. Okay, so think about it. If the Federal Reserve was created on Christmas Eve, 1913, and so then uh, Christmas Eve 1933 would be 20 years exactly, so it's nine months short of uh, 20 years, and they bankrupted the country. And uh, if you want to read the rest of this, uh, stop the video and you can read it. That's the point I want to make as far as this is concerned. Federal Reserve notes or IOUs is found in the Bankster Thieves 1 and 2 videos. Anything purchased with Federal Reserve notes is purchased on United States credit. Think about it. If you buy something on United States credit or the credit of any other corporation, who owns it? Well, the corporation owns it. In this case, it's the United States. If the United States is owned and operated by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, then the bankster thieves really own it, don't they? And uh, this is uh, Gold Reserve Act of 1934. Uh, uh, Section 15 says, as used in this act, the term United States means the government of the United States, and the term currency of the United States means the currency, which is legal tender in the United States. And so, uh, and includes United States notes and Federal Reserve notes. So, therefore, Federal Reserve notes are meant for internal use only. And it, think about it, that's exactly, they're meant for internal use of the government only, and that is it. And uh, and then if you go to uh, uh, section 16, it says the right to alter, amend, appeal this act is hereby expressly reserved. In other words, this act is set in stone forever. And section 17, all acts and parts of acts inconsistent with any of the provisions of this act are hereby repealed. So. This is it. This is the law as far as the bankster thieves as Federal Reserve notes are concerned. And uh, and if you use Federal Reserve notes, you're saying that you're a government employee. That's what you're saying. And the bankster, or I should say, the de facto courts that are owned and operated by the UN can presume it. Mortgages are found in Roman civil law. Negotiable instrument law is a subset of Roman civil law. Federal Reserve notes, Bank of Canada notes, Bank of England notes are meant for internal use of the government only. By using a negotiable instrument to purchase things, the de facto courts presume you consent to the martial law rule, as found in We Are Under Martial Law Rule video and the de facto courts video. Because you purchased everything in their private money system, the Federal Reserve notes, uh, Bank of Canada notes, or Bank of England notes, technically the banker owns, the banksters own what you purchased. That's why they tax it. Why, uh, by orchestrating the subprime mortgage crisis, the bankster thieves are just taking what they've already what they already own, technically, and this is all made possible because of Roman civil law, the United Nations, and the Vatican. That's exactly where this is coming from, and I want to say right now that I have many wonderful friends who happen to be Catholic, and many of them are feeding me this information, quite frankly, and so I don't want this to detract negatively on any person or any living soul. I don't want to use the word person anyone who happens to be Catholic because they're victims of this as much as anybody else. Because you accept Federal Reserve notes, Bank of Canada notes, Bank of England notes as compensation for your labor, the de facto courts can presume that you're a government employee as found in the de facto courts video. And then uh, this is one of the things they like to do is they've created, remember in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the bankrupt corporate so-called governments video talks about this. There's been created a fictitious federal state of XXX within a state. Okay, that's exactly what they do. So there's there's two states of Texas, and one is all block capital letters, and one is an upper lower case, and, but it's always the one in all block capital letters that you see operating all over the place, and that's a federal entity. Okay, that has nothing to do with 
with and if you're involved in anything dealing with that then uh, like uh, motor vehicles or like anything with the bankster thieves that's all federal jurisdiction and so if you're involved with anything to do with that federal state of texas or the federal state of tennessee or the federal state of whatever then uh, then that's federal jurisdiction and um, and you need to understand that and the nature of that jurisdiction uh, Thomas Jefferson at the at the debate over the recharge of the bank bill said, I believe the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Well, wasn't that prophetic, eh? I mean, that's exactly what's going on. Uh, this is Robert H. Hemphill, for a, a credit manager, manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta for eight years. Uh, quote, if all bank loans were paid, no one would have a bank deposit. There would not be a dollar of currency or coin in circulation. This is a staggering thought. We are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have into circulation, cash or credit. If the bank create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. We are absolutely without a permanent monetary system. When one gets a complete grasp upon the picture, the tragic absurdity of our hopeless position is almost incredible. But there it is. If the banking problem is the most important subject intelligent persons can investigate and reflect upon, it is so important that our present civilization may collapse unless it is widely understood and the defects remedy very soon. And boys and girls, we're on the verge of a collapse right now, and Obama is putting it all together for you. Uh, Churchill's chief counselor, Lord Robert Lord Vansittart, September 1940, to Foreign Minister Lord Halifax, quote, The enemy is the German Reich and not Nazism, and those who haven't understood this uh, haven't understood anything. And think about what he's saying, okay? They don't care how much of a dictator uh, Hitler is. They don't care how many people he's murdering. They care about the fact about something else, okay? And uh, and um, uh, we're going to see what that is here in a minute. And this is Winston Churchill, the Second World War, uh, uh, burned 1960 in his book, okay? Germany's unforgivable crime before World War II was its attempt to loosen its economy out of the world trade system and to build up an independent exchange system from which the world finance couldn't profit anymore. We butchered the wrong pig. Okay, well, think about what he's saying. Germany printed their own money. That's exactly what happened. Germany didn't borrow it from the bankster thieves. They just printed it. And, uh, and the bankster thieves made war on them. That's what was going on. Not the political doctrine of Hitler has hurled us into this war. The reason was the success of his increase in building a new economy. The roots of war were envy, greed, and fear. And that's Major General J.F.C. Fuller, a historian in England. Um, quote, we made a monster, a devil out of Hitler, therefore we couldn't disavow it after the war. After all, we mobilized the masses against the devil himself, so we were forced to play our part in this diabolical scenario after the war. In no way we could have pointed out to our people that the war was only an economic preventative measure. And that's uh, U.S. Foreign Minister James Baker in 1992. I remember him. That was under the first Bush administration, or was it? Yeah, I think it was the first Bush administration. Um, Winston Churchill to Truman, uh, uh, USA, uh, March 1946. The war wasn't only about abolishing fascism, but to conquer sales markets. We could have, if we had intended to, prevented this war from breaking out without doing one shot, but we didn't want to. In other words, it had everything to do with Hitler and the bankster thieves making war on him because because uh, because he was printing his own money, he wasn't borrowing it from the bankster thieves. The American Revolution was primarily fought over King George III's uh, uh, Currency Act. Benjamin Franklin said the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system, which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators, was probably the prime cause of the revolution. And um, this is a statement by Colonel Edward Mandel House in a private meeting with Woodrow Wilson, and it says very soon every American will be required to register their biological property. Gee, that sounds like children in a national system designed to keep track of the people that will operate under the ancient system of pledging. By such methodology, we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect our security as a chargeback uh, for our fiat 
paper currency. Gee, that sounds like a Federal Reserve note. Every American will be forced to register or suffer not being able to work and earn a living. Well, gee, aren't we surprised at that? They will be our chattel. We will hold the security interest over them forever by operation of law merchant under the scheme of secure transactions. Well, gee, you know, that sounds like Unidroid. Uh, Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivering the bills of lading to us, will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent forever to remain economic slaves through taxation secured by their pledges. You know, isn't that exactly what's going on? And it goes on. They will be stripped of their rights and given the commercial value designed to make us a profit, and they will be none the wiser. For not one man in a million could ever figure out, figure our plans, and if by accident one or two would figure it out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. After all this is the only logical way to fund government by floating liens and debt to the registrants in the form of benefits and privileges. This will inevitably reap to us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor to this fraud, which we will call social insurance. They even admit it's a fraud. Without realizing it, every American will insure us for any loss we may incur, and in this manner, every American will unknowingly be our servant, however grudgingly, the people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of the president of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. And again, that's uh, Colonel Edward Mandel House in a private meeting with Woodrow Wilson. And then Woodrow Wilson said, uh, after he passed the Federal Reserve Act, he said, I'm a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. A growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. We've come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. Do you think anything's changed? A government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. After World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, uh, Germany was forced to repay the cost of the war uh, and was bankrupt. Hitler's crime was that he did not borrow money from the bankster thieves. He printed it. And as a result, the German economy was turned around in less than three years. Kennedy circulated $6 billion of U.S. Treasury notes, and Johnson's first act while on the plane uh, to D.C. from Dallas after they murdered him was to recall those notes. Lincoln was killed because he circulated $400 million in U.S. Treasury notes. Uh, uh, President Garfield was killed because he wanted to circulate U.S. Treasury notes. Under Gaddafi, Libya had debt-free currency, and they ha had him killed. Saddam Hussein was preparing to circulate a gold-backed debt-free currency uh, until he was killed. Christ was killed three days after he threw the money changers out of the temple. The bankster thieves will stop at nothing to keep their power. It's satanic. This is diabolically evil. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by sword, the other by debt. John Adams, 1826. The money powers prey upon the nation in times of peace and conspire against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolent than autocracy, and more selfish than bureaucracy. It denounces as public enemies all who question its methods or throw light upon its crimes as a result of the war. Corporations have been enthroned, an era of corruption in high places will follow, and the money powers of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. Well, wasn't that prophetic? That's exactly what's happened. When injustice becomes law, then resistance becomes duty. And so is there any wonder why Christ threw the bankster thieves out of, the, out of, the, of his day out of the temple? Christ even called them thieves. The bankster thieves will force all governments into bankruptcy either by internal intrigues or by getting a foreign government to make war on the de jure government. In order to stay out of bankruptcy, the government needs the capability to have access to resources beyond gold and silver, but at the same time lawful payment must always be made. Labor certificates is a, is a valuable, labor is just as valuable as gold or silver, labor is not commercial. Under Title 15, United States Code, Section 17, the labor of a human being is not a commodity or art article of commerce. The right to pursue happiness is the right to get compensation for labor. Uh, Butcher's Union Company versus Crescent City, Colorado, U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, as it says, uh, it has been well said that the property which every man has is his own labor. Um, and uh, that same case goes on, the patrimony of the poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his own hands, and to hinder his employing his strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper, without injury to his neighbor, is a plain violation of the most sacred property. Uh, Algier versus State of Louisiana, 
Uh, this is a U.S. Supreme Court again. Uh, the right to follow any of the common occupations of light is an inalienable right. It was formulated under some of, under the phrase pursuit of happiness and the Declaration of Independence. And so the right to get compensation for labor is the right to pursue happiness. A labor certificate would certify that $1 has been performed or $10 or whatever is appropriate. It would look just like a Federal Reserve note except it would say labor certificate or a certificate of labor on the top. The government would give them to their employees as compensation for labor. A labor certificate would not be a promissory note or a bank note because there's no promise to pay and it's not issued by a bank. The labor has already been performed. A labor certificate would not be an IOU or any debt because in order for it to get issued, a dollar's worth of labor had to be already performed. A labor certificate would certify that one dollar, as defined by the Coinage Act of 1792, of labor has been performed. A labor certificate would be just as valuable as a lawful one dollar coin. A labor certificate would be lawful money. We can refuse to... What can we do? We can refuse to participate in their de facto system. We can use any other money system like labor certificates. Uh, but Federal Reserve notes, Bank of Canada notes, uh, Bank of England notes, we can use qualified endorsements on all checks and negotiable instruments. Uh, the one I like to use is for deposit for credit on account or in exchange for federal re uh, non-redeemable, actually I should say non-redeemable Federal Reserve notes at face value. Um, and I've, I know other people that use uh, redeem for lawful money, 12 U.S.C. Section 411. Now, uh, uh, either one of those would work. Under 12 U.S.C. Section 411, Federal Reserve notes are supposed to be redeemable. And so um, I've tried to redeem them, and they won't redeem them. And so that's why I put, uh, I'm basically saying that this is a tax-free exchange. By putting down for deposit for credit on a counter in exchange for non-redeemable Federal Reserve notes at face value, I'm saying that uh, this is a tax-free exchange. And uh, by the people putting down redeem for lawful money, they're still saying that, uh, that uh, the same thing, basically. Um, Anyways, we can educate ourselves so we know when our rights are being violated. We can work with our friends and neighbors to reestablish our common law juries and our common law judicial courts. We can educate our public servants because many of them do not know any more than we do. We can educate other people by circulating this video in any, in any other way possible. We can work with our friends and neighbors to get the United Nations out of America and Canada and anywhere that wants to be free. The United Nations is owned and operated by the bankster thieves and their Vatican handlers. We can educate ourselves about what a common law jury is and what the law of the land is. We can demand a common law jury of our peers. Judgment Day is coming for these bankster thieves, and, and the Bible actually talks about it, in my opinion, in the book of Revelations. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to seeing some of them do that little dance they do at the end of a common law rope. There are common law courts springing up all over, and these thieves are going to be brought to some real justice. Uh, uh, this uh, international tribunal uh, that has uh, convicted the, the, the queen, uh, and, and I'd like to call her something else, but uh, I guess I'll leave it off with this video. Uh, but if you watch my other videos, you hear what I say about her. Uh, anyways, uh, convicted her of crimes against uh, humanity, and uh, that the Pope uh, uh, Ratzinger got convicted, and now this latest one that calls himself Francis got convicted. Uh, but uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing those suckers do that little dance. But uh, you know, uh, no matter what, uh, there's judgment day is going to come on in the hereafter, and then they're going to be held accountable. I'm glad it's not up to me. We can never take the law into our own hands because that makes us worse than they are. Upcoming events, color of law, fire of the United Nations judicial whores in Texas, a city of Fort Worth pigs, city of Grand Prairie pigs, how to do a habeas corpus, and in and, uh, and reference to the, the terminology pig, that's an acronym, stands for persons in government who intend to perjure their own soul. Many of the people, that's not to say that everybody that works for the city of Fort Worth is a pig because that's absolutely not true. Uh, or the city of Grand Prairie. Um, there's a lot of good and honorable people that work there, so I just want to qualify that, because usually I have it in a video, but I don't believe I have it in this one. So uh, I'll just make that statement right here. Now, how do you do a habeas corpus, citizenship, uh, uh, fire the United Nations judicial whores in America? Copies of these documents can be found on my private group at Yahoo called Administrating Your Public Servants. I've also got one at Google. I've also got um, a, a fan page at... Um, at uh, Facebook called Sovereignty International and a private group there as well. I've got YouTube videos, uh, my my uh, YouTube profile, Sovereign Living. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, you know, I mean, you need to be watching some of those anyways, uh, just as a, as a basis for watching this one. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can send me an email now. 
Um, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, listen to the video, and uh, I hope you have a real nice day.